Disciples Bible class, Bible study class coming on. Uh, it starts on the uh, 4th, I'm sorry, the 6th of October, so in two days, uh, that you can still sign up. There are sign-up sheets out here available for you. It'll run between 7 and 8, 15, and will run for the next six weeks. So if you want to be a part of that study, you can do that. Also, we need to extend the sympathy of our church to Ray and Marilyn Aspinall on the death of Marilyn's brother, Kenneth. He passed away this past week. Uh, that is in the bulletin. Additionally, we want to extend the sympathy of our church to Scott and Susan Boys at the death of Susan's mother. So let's be in prayer as we uh, go to the Lord today. Father, thank you that you love us, that you watch over us, and you meet all of our needs. We ask for your spirit to be just touching these families that have had losses. That they might experience your peace and your grace in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Tasted and seen of the 
we welcome you into this place. As we worship you, as we lift our voices to you, help us to become aware of your presence. Fill us, fill this place with your spirit. Father, help us to live each day looking to be in your presence, to live each day with you in our lives, for you to be our hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I was in seminary probably 20 odd years ago, and at that time I was not a brethren, but I did meet up with some odd people called the brethren. And I remember being in class one day and the discussion of communion came up or the topic of communion came up. And one of the brethren students began to talk about, well, when we practice communion, we, we do it twice a year and we wash one another's feet as part of it and we have a meal and I'm like, eh, eh. people are like, what? You do what? I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church. Communion was very simple. It was go up front. The priest would hand you a wafer. Somebody else would give you uh, the opportunity to take that. You'd walk off to the side. We almost never took the cup part of things, at least as I was growing up. Then I got saved in a Baptist church where they did communion once a month. And again, it was a little cup. It got passed around to you. And there was a little plate full of bread. It got passed around and everybody took some. And then uh, we, we, we partook of communion in that way. And so this guy starts talking about foot washing. And so someone said to him, again, not a brother in person, of course, they said, well, why do you do that? And his answer was this, because Jesus said to. By the way, that's a fairly good answer. <laughs> it's not bad, right? Oh, well. It's the reason why the brethren historically don't take oaths because they read Jesus and they read very straightforwardly and it says that we shouldn't swear by anything. So we're not gonna take oaths and we're not gonna swear in court and we're not going to do these things because Jesus said that, so we're just not going to do it. Our approach to the scriptures is fairly straightforward. Read it and understand it and then put it into practice. Actually do it. It's a very kind of straightforward approach. So when we get to John chapter 13 and there's this scene described of Jesus with his disciples, it's the Passover meal and he is doing some things with them. One of the things he does, and I'll read it for you here in a moment, he gets up from the table and he begins to wash their feet and at the end he gives this kind of summary about, you just saw me do this, now you go do it. The brethren looked at that and said, we should do that. So let's read John 13 and let's talk about that. We're going to talk in turn about the three parts of a traditional brethren communion service, the foot washing, the meal, and the bread and the cup. And as you came in, hopefully you got one of these little containers. It has juice in it and a wafer. Um, I'll try to remember to give you instructions about how to open it safely. Yeah, it's like a juice box. Don't squeeze when you're trying to open up the juice part because my notes have the evidence of what will happen. And I don't mean what I wrote. John 13, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Uh, some translations say he showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Ju Jesus knew that the father had put all things in his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said, to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, the whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew what was, who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. 
Now that you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now, as I begin to talk some more about foot washing, two of our deacons, Pat and Jim McGinnis, are going to wash one another's feet. So the scene is an evening meal. It's been prepared. People have gathered. Uh, But one thing appears to have been left undone by the disciples. It seems as though all the folks gathered in the room, but nobody took time to wash anyone's feet. There's debate about why that happened. Uh, Some suggest that it was just an oversight. Nobody thought to do it. Uh, Others suggest that it's an evidence of the wrangling that went on amongst the disciples that we read about in other places where they're arguing amongst themselves who's the greatest and who's going to be at the left and the right hand of Jesus when he enters into his kingdom and all of that, which of course Jesus rebukes uh, rapidly. For whatever reason or reasons, no one has washed anyone's feet, it looks like. So Jesus, in the middle of the meal, and by the way, of course, this should have happened at the beginning of the meal, before the meal even started, as people entered into the room, the house, whatever, they should have had the opportunity to have their feet washed. Not as a symbol, but as a real practical thing. I've been in conversation with somebody recently, and they said, I'm not letting my grandchildren in my house anymore till they wash their feet, because they constantly wear flip-flops. And we know what flip-flops are? It's like little chunks of rubber with a strap on it. So when kids with little chunks of rubber with a strap on it go walking around outside, what do their feet look like when they come to enter the house? They're a mess. And who wants that drug through their house? So very practical. Go back to the ancient world. Open-toed shoes, kind of a dry, arid place. They're walking on unpaved roads. This isn't concrete. There's no cement. Uh, What do those folks' feet look like? Dirty. It's practical. It's an act of hospitality, and it's a very practical thing to do. No one's done it, it looks like. Jesus gets up in the middle of the meal, prepares himself, and goes and begins to wash each of the disciples' feet. It's interesting to note that. He washed them all. That means he washed Peter's feet. We know that because Peter has this conversation with him about why he shouldn't. He also washed Judas's feet. That's the guy he knew was going about, about to betray him. He washed all of their feet. And he was teaching them something that is more important than the act that he did. He was teaching them not in words, but in his practice of what he did to love and to serve. To love and to serve other people. Uh, Peter is the kind of guy that often has something to say. So when he gets to Peter, Peter protests because Peter understands who Jesus is. Now, the person who should wash the feet of people coming into the home in a normal circumstance in the ancient world is the lowest ranking individual in the house. So that's the lowest slave, if there are slaves, or the lowest ranking family member. Jesus goes to wash Peter's feet and Peter gets that he is the master and Lord. And He says to him, no, 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 I'm not going to receive this from you. I'm not going to do it. At the end of the passage, Jesus explains what he's done. Of course, I am your teacher and your Lord. Now that I've done this for you, you should do this for each other. You should wash one another's feet. So two things I want to highlight. Number one, um, I'm just going to glance at the water. The water looks very clean. Because what we're doing in this service is not actually washing one another's feet. We don't use soap and water and a scrub brush and whatever else you might use. This is symbolic. This is reminding us of what Jesus did. It's reminding us of what Jesus did and why he did it. Secondly, year after year in communion, I try to remember to say that when Jesus said to go and do the very same thing, he was not intending us only to wash one another's feet in some sort of ceremony or some time of of remembrance. He was encouraging us to wash one another's feet, meaning to humbly serve one another. Who is the greatest in the kingdom, according to Jesus? The least. And if the greatest in the kingdom on our worldly perspective and in the, you know, the creator of the universe bows down and washes your feet, then whose feet are you too good to wash? If you have an answer for that question, you may want to spend a little time in prayer on that. I think the Lord has something to say to you, right? So Peter says, I get who you are, Jesus. There's no way you're touching my feet. And Jesus says, oh no, this is how the kingdom works. 
The greatest serves everyone. The one who wants to be first is last. Do we have in us some desire to give up our status? Or to say in some way that we, uh, we deserve to be served and others don't deserve our service? Serving is going out of our way to meet the needs of others. Service is not just washing feet in a symbolic way on an evening service or even as we've seen demonstrated tonight. Service is about the orientation of giving up our wants, our needs, our preferences for the benefit of someone else. So we gather in the spring and in the fall to symbolize our willingness to serve. To symbolize our willingness to be humble before others and to give up so that we can benefit someone else. So we should ask ourselves, whose feet today would we struggle to wash? In a normal evening communion service, we'd all be gathered in this room, in this room and we would be at tables and then we would dismiss you and the men would go to the men's washing rooms and the, the, uh, the women would go to the women's rooms that are assigned for foot washing because that's how we do it. What we did today was for social distancing purposes. We kept it in the family, but that's not how it would work at a regular time. But you'd go off and you don't know whose feet you're going to wash. But if, what, what if you walked into that room and you, you got eye to eye with somebody and you're supposed to wash their feet and you have some problem with that person? Who would you struggle to wash their feet? Who might you be holding a grudge against? Because communion is about coming together. Communion is about our oneness and about willingness to serve and humble ourselves. Well, the second part of the communion service is the meal. And we are, we are thankful that eating is a part of what it means to follow Jesus. We're very pleased with that. Um, we look at a passage like Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, and we get Luke's summary of what's going on in the early church. He gives us this little quick summary, right? He says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled in awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Luke gives us this little summary. He says they devoted themselves to a, a variety of things. Uh, but, but devotion is about giving yourselves uh, seriously to things. So the first was they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. That is, they paid attention to what the apostles were saying. To us, we would translate that or, or apply that by saying we want to be people of the word. We want to read the Bible, understand the Bible, and put it into practice. That's a very good brethren thing to do. It's a very good Christian thing to do, to live out what we're learning from God's word, to read it and understand it and put it into practice. And for that to happen, we have to be devoted to it. It can't be a sidelight. We have to be serious about our study and understanding of the scriptures. It says also they were devoted to fellowship. Now, again, we think of fellowship very often in the church as food-centered. We're having a fellowship meal. We line up all the tables, right? Did you know that we measure between the tables to make sure we can get them all in? There's an actual recorded measurement that we use to line the tables up. I, I just probably revealed some fellowship committee secret that I shouldn't have. I'll probably get fired. So this is my last sermon, guys. Uh, well, maybe they won't even let me do the outdoor service today. Anyway, so we, we line them up and we pack everybody in and there's food all over the place. If it's the soup and sandwich, there's soups and sandwiches on either side and, you know, dessert somewhere. Uh, we love to eat and they love to eat. They get together and have fellowship, right? That's what we think about in terms of fellowship. But fellowship means living life together. It's not just about having a meal together. Having meals together is a part of that life. It's part of the thing of your family. Right? You get together and have a meal. You might have uh, regular meals in your home uh, right now, and then you have a, a family gathering of extended family, and you eat together. Some of you have a habit of every Sunday afternoon, there's a family gathering, and it ends with a meal, or there's a family gathering that starts with a meal and then rolls on into the evening. It, food is a part of it, but is not the whole of it. Fellowship, they devoted themselves to one another. In the, in the same passage, it says they sold their possessions and gave to those who had a need. Fellowship, they lived life together. They were regularly in contact with each other and they were caring and loving 
for one another. And it says also they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, which again might be about meals, but might be more about they celebrated communion together, referring to Jesus breaking bread. They did eat together. They ate together in their homes. They didn't have church facilities to eat in, but they devoted themselves further to taking communion. Finally, it says they devoted themselves to prayer. They gave time and effort and energy to spend time with the Lord, to seek him in prayer, to ask for their needs to be met, to ask for the community needs to be met, to worship him and to praise him. But on the night that we're talking about, the meal the disciples gathered together with in the upper room was no ordinary meal. It was the Passover meal. It was a meal that God instituted to remind the people perpetually, year after year after year, have this meal so you remember what I did in the Exodus, in the leaving Egypt, in the getting out of bondage and slavery and mistreatment. Remember how I showed up. What does the meal mean? The meal is an act of being together. Uh, we, we call it funny in the Brethren Church, we call it the love feast. Now, if you've had communion with us, um, there may be a lot of love in that room, but there ain't much of a feast, right? It's a very simple meal because it's symbolic. Like the washing of the feet, it's not a scrubbing of the dirt. It's symbolic to remind us. The meal reminds us that we are together Folks, the world, our world, our country needs to see togetherness from the church. We got a pretty divided world these days. We have divisions uh, based on all kinds of things right now. We've got issues uh, where people are maskers and no maskers, right? I wear it all the time. I never wear it. I think it's a hoax. And everywhere in between. We've got economic differentiations with people. We have racial differences with people, and they cause divisions. Uh, You may be aware, um, and maybe this is news, we're in a presidential election cycle. You may have picked up on that. Uh, Jennifer and I watched the debate the other night. We watched about an hour of it, and um, we had to shut it off. I was profoundly sad by the behavior and the things that went on during that debate. We have a divided country, folks. You know, with people taking sides and people can't talk to each other and people can't uh, commune with each other because they have different thoughts. The church should be a place where somebody who wants this candidate would have a meal with somebody who wants this candidate. In fact, we should be the kind of people that somebody who wants this candidate would wash the feet of somebody who wants this candidate. We ought to be able to disagree about all kinds of things. We ought to be able to disagree about when and where and how you should wear your mask and still love one another and commune together with one another. The world needs a a, a message of, lived out message of being able to love and serve and yet still have differences because we don't do that very well as a society, especially right now. Well, the final part of the communion service then is the bread and the cup. And that's uh, this cute little container you get to hold in your hand. And in it, uh, we talk about uh, the words Jesus spoke when he uh, sort of instituted this. They come from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Often on a communion uh, service evening, we would talk about just a few of the verses. But just to kind of stir things up a little bit, let's roll back a little bit. Let me read to you, starting in verse 17, and you will hear that the picture of the church in Acts chapter 2 is not exactly carried out in the church in Corinth, at least at the time Paul's writing. Paul is not happy with the church in Corinth. You'll pick that up in the beginning of this. Listen to what he has to say. Chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, swallow hard, for your meetings do more harm than good. He's talking about them getting together as a church. Your church meetings are doing more harm than good. Now, I don't know how that's like where you rate that on on a church evaluation form, but to me, that seems like a bad evaluation of the church. Now, what's going on? In the first place, he says, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And he says, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, 
to be dif- uh, the differences among you show which of you has God's approval. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your private suppers. As a result, some persons remain hungry while others get drunk. Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this manner. So you get the pictures of what's going on. They're celebrating communion. It seems like it functions like a carry-in. Like you bring your own food in. And so some people bring a lot and some people have very little to bring. And the people who have a lot don't share with the people who have very little. Acts 2, they sold their possessions and they gave to those in need. We have a feast. You have very little. We're going to hold on to our feast and not share with you. But we're all part of the same church and we're going to celebrate communion together. Do you see how bizarre that is? An economic difference that is being lived out in a you need to stay separate from us. Paul's not happy. But after these corrective word, Paul relays the words of Jesus when he said, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said to them, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. While Jesus was in full knowledge of what Judas was about to do, he gave thanks, broke the bread and told them what was about to happen. His body would be broken in the sense that he would give his life as a sacrifice for us. He was about to go to the cross to die a horrible death on our behalf. He went for us. His body was broken for us. So he raised the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, this represents my broken body. Each time you partake of it, we are to remember what Christ has done. So take a moment. and Just silently at your seat. Thank God for what he's done for you. Father, thank you for your amazing work in our lives. We are truly thankful, and each of us has different things that we would consider and remember where you have met us, where you have corrected us, where you have worked in our lives. But together, we all can say thank you for your son's death on the cross. Amen. I guess the first question I should ask is, does everybody have one of these that wants one? There are still some in the back that you can grab if you want one. Are we good? I can't see, all I see is shadows, so I'm going to go with good. All right, so if you take your cup and try to peel off just the first layer to get you to the wafer, right, if you draw back on your finger, you can probably get that off, get to that without opening the drink part, and then take out that wafer. It's a tradition of ours in the evening communion services to take the bread together. And so I invite you to say the words that are here before you. They're in your bulletin if you have them there. It says, this bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. goes on to say, in the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Jesus took a cup of wine from the table and he used it to symbolize his own blood. And his own blood and a new relationship that God was initiating between God himself and and man. No longer would sin be dealt with by the sacrifice of an animal. No longer would sin be held off to be dealt with, but Jesus would deal with it once and for all by dying on the cross for our sins. So we take this cup and you can unwrap it by pulling back on the tab. Just don't squeeze real hard on the cup.
We take this cup because it reminds us of the spilled blood of Christ, who died as a sacrifice for our sins. We drink together after repeating these words. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be reminded of the foundation of what it means to follow you. It means that we have said yes to your son and to his offer of forgiveness. We have said yes to your willingness to accept us not only as forgiven, but into your home, into your family. And Father, we take this bread and this cup and we think about the meal that we could have had together and we think of the opportunity to wash one another's feet, all to remind us of all that you have done for us. So Father, bless us in Jesus' name, amen. is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Father, we are amazed by your uh, love for us. You know us on our best days. You know us on our worst days. You know everything about us. And you sent your son Jesus to die for us. We are so thankful, so undeserving. Help us to live out a life of gratitude to you in what we do and what we say, what we think, how we treat one another, and how we live in this life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.